Greetings folks and welcome to the Electromaker Show. This is your midweek roundup of all things Maker and Embedded and Lovely. Now this week we have a plethora of projects but also a very interesting spin on the Arduino on Crowd Supply and we'll be looking at a very minimal carrier board for the Raspberry Compute Module 4 uh, as well as giving away something with the mystery box competition that is making a return. So with all that to get through, let's get on with the show. We're going to start this show looking at a few projects, and this first one combines uh, one of my favorite maker YouTubers, who's a bit loony, um, with VGA, which is a video protocol that I have fond memories of fiddling with. Um, and he has taken an ESP32 and really pushed the limits of what you can do with it. So BitLooney's latest video is the creation of BitLooney's VGA Madness, which is a VGA board. Six channels all running from one ESP32. Um, it's just the best idea. I, as I said, I, I, I've got previous with VGA. I love it. Um, and uh, I knew that you can run uh, VGA from an ESP32. Um, in fact, one of uh, BitLooney's uh, previous inventions is, uh, I think, an ESP12 that runs a single channel of VGA. But this runs six at once. Um, and uh, this video goes through uh, the idea behind it, how it comes together, and um, uh, the mistakes along the way. And the mistakes are always the best. Um, uh, sorry, BitLooney. Uh, but yes, watching you make mistakes is 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 very funny sometimes. I, I promise uh, it's not schadenfreude. Uh, I I'm just smiling. <laughs> So, as always, I don't want to show you much more of the video on the show. I'd much prefer you went to BitLooney's channel, watched it yourself, and uh, left him a comment saying how, how good you think this project is. Um, and uh, this is really a, a nice way of seeing um, an idea go from something that is a rough idea to the design. And, of course, on his second channel, you can see the long-form design videos, uh, which were live-streamed. Um, and then from uh, making a prototype at home to ordering a prototype, it's just a fantastic project from start to finish. And yes, uh, the fact that it uses VGA as its output makes me very, very happy indeed. Up next, a real-time voice changer project. And before we even look into it, I want to play you just a few seconds of it so you can hear exactly what I mean. <laughs> Yes, yeah, so this is the latest video from Robotics Canty, and as you can hear, um, it is a really quite impressive sounding, completely DIY, homemade voice changer that uses a mask covering the face, capturing the audio and changing it in real time, which is not an easy thing to do. That is some quite high level digital signal processing. Um, and yeah, this, this project is really quite impressive considering the simple parts that was used to make it. So here's a quick look inside the mask, and it is a very interesting build. You can see it's a completely DIY circuit, uses the little Electret microphone here, and these two mystery ICs, and I say mystery ICs because he does explain what they are, but I, I don't know because uh, the video is in Hindi and the auto-translate isn't working. Um, now, um, I do quite frequently watch maker videos from other people in different parts of the world who don't make the videos in English, because why should they make it in their local language? Um, but usually uh, YouTube's auto-translate does at least half a decent job, but it's just straight up not letting me uh, translate this video for some strange reason. Um, however, I'm pretty sure that um, in time there will be more details on this project, as Robotics Canty does have a website as well. Um, oh look, it picked up a single word there. <laughs> um, the well done, well done auto-translate. Um, but yes, uh, I do think that in time that we will be able to find a little bit more about this project because uh, Robotics Canty has a website um, and there there are a little bit more details on the projects that he makes. Like this, for example, on the Robotics Canty website, there are write-ups of different projects with just a little bit of extra information. Presumably that will also happen with this mask project too. So yes, a very inventive DIY project using just cheap off-the-shelf parts. No programming, just a really inventive circuit. Um, and uh, as you can see, there's the components here, and um, it lists the components. Those two mystery ICs are not really all that mysterious, because I mean, one of them is going to be an op amp, probably. The other one's going to be some kind of converter, LM209 or something like that for frequency to voltage conversion. Um, just a lovely inventive uh, uh, idea for a circuit. And also just something that I find refreshing, because as I said, it's really nice to dip into videos uh, where English is not the primary language. Um, but yeah, uh, I usually have at least a little bit of help with the auto translator, which I didn't get today. Um, but I'm really, uh, uh, this is the first time I've come across Robotics Canty, and I'm really looking forward to going back through and watching some of the other videos that they have made. Um, it really does seem like a channel with a lot to teach. Now moving on to smart plants, I'm a big fan of smart IoT plant setup things with moisture sensors and automatic watering, mostly because every plant I've tried to keep has died and I am terrible at keeping them alive. Um, but this does something a little bit different. 
Because this project from Kevin Arn takes a much simpler approach. Now, this is the Hackaday blog, a blog by Brian Cockfield, um, and the uh, actual project is also up on Hackaday. I will link the blog post because um, you can just get to it from this link. Um, but put simply, rather than moisture sensors and automatic pumping and all this kind of stuff, it just has a weight sensor in the bottom here. So if the plant gets lighter, that means there's less water in the soil. It's beautifully simple. It's a really nice way of doing it. Um, and because of that, the project is wonderfully simple as well. So as the project stands, this is what it looks like. This is an ESP32 development board. This is a load still, uh, cell stripped out of something else. Um, and this little, uh, I believe this was a something that was bought later, a board for going between the load cell and the ESP32 to get uh, greater accuracy. Um, but it's definitely worth reading through the entire project because it didn't start here. There were various different uh, things that were tried. And if you go down far enough, you uh, discover that it was actually a uh, commercial scale that was originally ripped apart. And they've tried to get that load cell working. I believe it's the same load cell still from this, but they've got a different um, a breakout board for it now. Um, and it's super interesting. Um, the, it links out to a, a fantastic thing on SparkFun about load cells and how they work. I had no idea that load cells generally actually had four different strain gauges on them in order to get an accurate weight reading. Very interesting stuff. So um, I will link the uh, original blog post in the description of the video because you can click through to it from there. And the final project in this first section of the show are these mini sumo robots that use microbit and microbit compatible boards. Um, what makes these notable is just the simplicity that goes into making them, and that is built into the design. So as you can see, this is on the Hackaday blog, and this is uh, Hans-Jürgen Grimstad's um, robot. Now, I don't think this is the first time that this um, thing has showed up, and I certainly had a memory, I, th I thought I'd seen this before. Um, and when you follow this link through, you actually see that this um, is a little bit older. This is from... Uh, 29th of February 2020 but what makes this new is there is now a video to go alongside it um, and this is a full explanation video of how this thing works. So I will link the Hackaday blog in the uh, description because that links out to both other links. I would highly recommend coming and watching the video though because it is a very good explanation of um, the idea behind this robot, how to put it together, the limitations that simplicity has, I think is the best way of putting this. Um, and uh, yeah, um, and the robots it's, uh, themselves work uh, wonderfully. Um, uh, uh, they are surprisingly nippy and they uh, do exactly what they are supposed to do, uh, uh, albeit find other robots and push them out of the ring. Um, and uh, the nice thing about it is, as mentioned um, in maybe the description here or somewhere else, these will work with the uh, micro bits, but also any other compatible edge connector board. So that includes uh, Adafruit's board, which I forget the name of currently. Clue, that's what I was trying to remember. Adafruit's sort of micro bit alike, although it does different things, is Clue. Anyway, I will link the Hackaday article uh, in the description of this video because that takes you to this video. It also takes you to the GitHub page where you can get all of the code, um, along with all of the bill of materials and things if you'd like to build one of these pint size and very simple sumo robots yourself. Just before moving on, I wanted to do a little quick housekeeping. So if you are watching this show and you are enjoying it, I would appreciate it a lot if you would give us a subscribe. Um, and by a subscribe, I mean underneath the video here is a button that says subscribe. If you are signed into YouTube, we will now show up in your subscriptions. Uh, that means that under the subscriptions tab, our videos will show up there. We're also much more likely to show up on your home page. Um, but this shouldn't necessarily change your usage of YouTube all that much. Um, however, if you click this little bell here and click all, then whenever we put a new show out, you will get a notification. That notification will only be here in YouTube under the bell. And as you can see, um, there are the notifications for the shows from previous weeks. Um, as long as you do not have a desktop notification set up for YouTube, uh, you won't be getting spammed by us when you are doing your work, but it will mean when you come to YouTube, you'll be able to just see whether there's a new show very easily. Um, and the final one, um, clicking like does not seem like an important thing to do, um, but it does, uh, well, it shows YouTube that you like the show. Um, and uh, the more people that like the show, the more likely it is that it will show other like-minded people the show. Um, so yes, uh, that's uh, a couple of completely free ways you can help us on YouTube. As always, there is, of course, no obligation. Over on the Electromaker website, there are a number of things you can do to support us here as well. Um, if you are a project maker, um, under the community tab, you can find that you can upload your projects to the Electromaker website. And as you know, if you're watching the show, we frequently feature people's projects from the Electromaker website on the show. Um, there's also a link to our Discord server there, which is a place that you can come to discuss the projects you're working on. Um, and at some point in the relatively near future, I'm looking forward to having a Discord-only live stream where we all work on something together. I'm just getting the setup ready for that. 
Um, and uh, of course, um, as always, the, absolutely the best way that you can support this show and support Electromaker in general is by heading to the Electromaker store when you're looking for bits and pieces for your next hobby project. As you can see by the name scrolling across the top of the page, we stock pretty much everything from everyone. Um, and if you are thinking of getting something, getting it from us would be a great help. Um, but yes, no obligation, and that's enough self-promotion just for now. Let's get on with the rest of the show, shall we? We're going to move on to a quick funding website things. And we have two things from CrowdSupply today, beginning with Wide Arduino, although that's not exactly what it's called, but I like to think of it as Wide Arduino. 644 and 1284 wide are uh, boards that are being launched as part of the microchip get launched program um, which if you're not familiar with it check out microchip get launched they are specifically there to help people launch their own hardware um, so if you have an idea for something and you're designing it and you're wondering how to launch it uh, yeah as well as crowd supply being a great place to fund it microchip is worth talking to the get launch team anyway uh, this is uh, Arduino compatible boards uh, and it takes the general Arduino idea and it just expands on it ever so slightly um, six Arduino compatible 80 mega 644 and 80 mega 12 84 boards with upgraded flash ram eprom and high power variants so this is still sticking very much with the same kind of microcontrollers you find in arduinos but with a bit more power um the thing i find super interesting uh from my perspective alone um is that uh there's these wide power variants um so you get the 3.3 volt ver versions the 5 volt versions for me the uh, power variants will be interesting because um the power board uh, has a dc to dc converter you can power the board with anything from 6 to uh from 6 volts to 24 volts and consume up to uh, 1 point, uh 1200 milliamps of current at 5 volts um which uh for someone who likes to power a bunch of different stuff at any given time from uh, directly from a microcontroller without having to worry about stepping up or stepping down power. Um, that's a really nice idea. I really like that. I'll leave it at that for now because this is a uh, pre-project. This is not started. This is not being funded yet. Uh, as always, you can sign up for more details if this is something that interests you. Um, oh, one other thing. Um, there is a very easy way of attaching an OLED module to this. It has a little port for attaching it via I squared C. Just a nice little touch, I thought. So moving on at a fair clip, um, I actually am a little short on time, but I couldn't not talk about this. It's very interesting. Uh, this is a hardware uh, encryption module. The idea behind it is that this is an FPGA. The core on here is, is completely open source. You can see how they built it, so you know there's no weird back doors. And of course, um, when it comes to things being cryptographically safe, you need to trust the encryption and decryption services so that you know that there isn't a secret way of someone decrypting encrypted information. And this uh, covers that very nicely by being an open soft core. Um, and it's designed to work nicely with uh, uh, Raspberry Pi and Arduino as well. So it's based around the Max 10 chip from Altera, which you may also know as the Intel uh, Max 10 chip, because uh, Intel now own Altera. Um, and this is the board, as you can see, attached to a Raspberry Pi. Um, and here it is in action, just very simply, very quickly. Um, here is uh, some information, and here it is getting uh, the, uh, encrypt encrypted. Um, here, okay, once again, nano plain text. They made some plain text with this is a very good test, and then they encrypted it. Um, and you can see you have your encrypted file here, and then they copied uh, it out to to a decrypted file and then when they looked at the decrypted file this is a very good test a very good test it is indeed um there is much more to say about this board but i will let you go to the crowd supply page and look at it yourself it's something i'm very interested in for a number of reasons um and if you are interested in getting your own you can back the project um it is 129 dollars for the basic board and bear in mind this is an fpga board they do not come cheap um, and there are various other uh, things you can get, like packs, packs, of, packs of two, and they have a JTAG adapter as well. Um, and they are currently funding as we speak, um, and they have made $3,500 of their $13,000 goal. If you would like to know more about this project, um, I will leave a link to it in the description of the video. It is time for that part of the show when an unassuming cardboard box becomes the mystery box. Yes, this is a competition that we run regularly on this show. Um, last week's uh, show, we gave away a known prize. That was the Nordic Thingy 91 kit, a very cool piece of kit. But usually we have this box, which is provided to us by the wonderful people at Mauser, um, And it is a box of completely mysterious things. Mysterious to me, too. I try to make a point of not being spoiled. Um, and so uh, it's a surprise to me as much as it is to the person that's going to win it. Now, the mystery, competition, uh, mystery box competition does have a caveat um we've given away evaluation kits uh, like up to 500 euros worth of value like and really amazing stuff we also once had a power supply that was the prize power supply it's a mystery that's the entire point and so i generally just reach my hand in and have a rummage around and see what i can find and that's two boxes two boxes that are attached to each other hang on 
Ooh, I think I understand. One moment, I... Boxes. Okay, so these are, in fact, two boxes that are attached to each other, and with good reason, they belong together. Um, these are both sealed, or at least uh, one of them has a static uh, case around the evaluation board, and this is a sealed box. So instead of opening it up and messing with it, I will just show you what I found in my few minutes of research. So the first of the two boxes is an evaluation board from Microchip. Um, this is the MP Lab Express evaluation board for the PIC 16F8855 controller. Um, and there's also a, uh, a little programmer on here, a potentiometer and a couple of push buttons, your usual good evaluation board stuff. But you'll also notice there is this header here, or these two headers, um, and these are designed to work with Microelectronica's click boards. Now, Microelectronica's clickboards are not dissimilar to Arduino Shields and Raspberry Pi hats in that they can slot into evaluation boards to do a variety of tasks. Um, and there are a huge number of companies that uh, use these in their boards. Um, but uh, specifically, the first one on the list is Microchip, um, and that's what this board is from. This is a Microchip evaluation board. Um, so yeah, these two things fit together perfectly. But as to what is in the smaller box is a very specific kind of microbus click connector. So the smaller box contains a click analyzer, and this is a very special board. And this is designed to go between the evaluation board, so in this case, the MP Lab Express evaluation board, and whatever click add-on that you were using at the time. Um, so let's just take one of these at completely random. Let's say you're using this um, LED matrix screen over here that I might be obscuring with my face. Look, there's one over here as well. Um, and it isn't acting the way that you want it to. Well, you can put this board in between that and the evaluation board, and this has its own controller and its own USB output, allowing you to analyze exactly what is going on with the Microbus click board that you are using. It's an extra level of hardware debugging built right in. It's a really cool idea. Usually you'd be getting probes out and messing with uh, oscilloscopes and all that kind of stuff to make this work. Um, and uh, reading through this very briefly, it really does seem like it can do quite a lot of stuff. If you are someone who likes to uh, prototype things, and get things working, especially from the ground up and from scratch, and we're wondering about things like timing um, and exactly what is going on between your uh, controller and your peripheral, this is the perfect tool for that. Um, anyway, I have enthused about this for long enough. Um, this is our mystery box prize for this week, and it's time to give it away at random to one of the people from the comments section from last week's video. And the winner of the mystery box competition this week, and I know already I'm not going to say this correctly, is Chizo Parzek. Chizo Parzek? You can let me know uh, how wrong I got that. Um, but yes, uh, uh, they left a comment on last week's video saying, thank you for another episode. Sam was okay as always. I cannot wait until you mention the version 2 of the Raspberry Pi Pico with USB-C. I can't wait to announce that too. But as you quite rightly put, it doesn't exist as of yet. I wonder what they'll do with version 2. Anyway, uh, congratulations. We'll be in touch with you as to how we can get this prize out to you. The Mystery Box competition will return on and off in between competitions for things that we know about. We have got some quite interesting giveaways coming up in the next little while, one of which is pretty big. Um, but anyway, that's, uh, that's a teaser for no reason whatsoever. Uh, let's get on with the rest of the show. We're going to close out the show by looking at a new minimal uh, carrier board for the Raspberry Pi Compute module um, and also uh, discuss the uh, kind of mildly scary security breach that happened in the 3D printing world recently. Um, but yes, firstly, that little board. Now, we are, as always, on the fantastic CNX software, um, and uh, I've got this here just so uh, you can see. Here is the compute module. So you know how small these things are already. These are pretty tiny in and of themselves. And look, there it is. This is uh, a absolutely tiny little uh, carrier board for the compute module. And you might be wondering what the point is. Um, but this is something that Ivan Kulichov has made. Um, and if I go to the Twitter, you can see that on the back here, there is a little bit more to be had. So um, it attaches via USB-C for power, um, and you have a few breakouts of different I.O. ports. And as he mentioned in this tweet just below my face, um, the GPIO 14 and 15 uh, can be accessed from... Uh, Oh, sorry, uh, the GPIO 14 and 15 are UART pins, and this can be powered via 5 volts rather than just USB. Um, it's just a very small but actually surprisingly practical little board. Anyway, the article goes on to give a little more information, and it also talks about um, alternatives, given that this isn't actually available as yet. Um, and also, uh, Ivan's Twitter is quite an interesting spot. Um, he is currently working on uh, several different compute module boards, um, the Upberry being an interesting looking one as well. Um, so if you are interested in compute module things, as I am getting increasingly so, um, yeah, these are two good places to have a little look. And finally, on this week's show, the spaghetti detective and the security breach that actually turned out to be a very wholesome moment in the 3D printing community. 
Now, um, we cover 3D printing occasionally on this show, um, but we don't go into much detail about it. And um, if you aren't someone who uses 3D printers all that often, you might wonder what the spaghetti detective is. So before going into the story, let's do a little bit of back work to get there. Now, the Spaghetti Detective is a service designed to help you with your 3D prints. Essentially, on the surface, what it does is it watches the prints, and if it sees something going wrong with its camera, um, it will stop the print, and it will stop you wasting a bunch of uh, uh, filament, and it's a really nice idea in principle. And it works with Octoprint really nicely, um, and it's something worth looking into if you are into 3D printing, especially if you're already using Octoprint. Um, this service is fantastic. Unfortunately, someone found a vulnerability in the Spaghetti Detective and someone with a 3D printer at home that had been left on standby, presumably, woke up to find a print that they did not ask for. They did not say print this. Someone connected remotely to their printer and printed this. And I don't think I really need to say why that is a horrific security flaw. So this Reddit thread is what I'm going to leave in the description of the video because I think it explains it all rather well. Um, and uh, the mod of the one of the mods of the 3D printer community has a, a big post at the top here talking about it. Um, and uh, the thing that's amazing is that uh, Kenneth Yang or Kenneth Yang again? Apologies if I'm pronouncing that wrong. Who is uh, one of the creators, uh, maybe the creator behind the Spaghetti Detective, um, showed up in this thread um, somewhere a little bit further down and uh, was very open about the fact. Um, that this security breach was a dumb mistake. Straight up just came out with it and said, yep, we made an error. And in fact, did a detailed analysis um, in a blog post on the Spaghetti Detective page about it, um, which is absolutely worth a read. Um, the thing that I find incredible um, is that when you look at the reaction to this, it's almost all people kind of saying, yes, you made a mistake, but you owned up to it. Well done. Well, I'm still going to use your service. Um, and I think that's a wonderful thing. Um, and in fact, when it says here, uh, this is a post by Kenneth Young. It says, as the developer behind the Spaghetti Detective, I never expected it blew up on Reddit like this. It was a terrible and embarrassing mistake that caused T uh, the Spaghetti Detective users, including the OP, to be worried about the security of their printer. And it was exactly the problem you wanted to solve with the Spaghetti Detective. And uh, they're quite annoyed by it. Um, and as mentioned, the detailed report uh, is linked here. Um, I think the report is also linked here. Yes, uh, update two. Um, the, so again, this one third is the one that we'll put in. Um, and uh, this, this is the thing that I love. Um, the strange thing is I feel more loved than ever. I look at those comments that gave me the benefit of the doubt and I can't help but wonder where did all the trolls go? I love serving a community of awesome fellow 3D printing enthusiasts. And if anything, this incident will be the best motivator for me to get better at what I do, creating great software for the 3D printing community. Um, it's very rare that someone can make a mistake on the internet and not be absolutely eviscerated by people. Um, and this is uh, more than just whether you're into you know, 3D printing or make a culture as a whole. This is a nice example of someone discovering an, uh, a vulnerability, but just printing. I mean, bear in mind that this original post, someone must have made this model to send to someone's printers. It is the most artistic way of showing a vulnerability you can imagine. Um, and then for them to be so forgiving and for, for this detailed analysis, which um, I, yeah, I, I, I mean, I re literally just read the first two paragraphs of this so far. And um, when I first looked into this for the show, I hadn't, I, I don't think this had actually been published. Um, so yeah, that's all much of a muchness. I will leave a link to this in the description. Um, this is a fascinating thing to see and very heartwarming to see how well it seems to have been resolved. <laughs> That has been our show for this week. Thank you so much for joining me and thank you for all of the support that you are showing the show on YouTube um, and by joining the Discord server and of course by shopping at the Electromega shop. It is all very, very much appreciated. Um, we will be back next week with a whole new plethora of projects to look at along with hopefully some new and interesting funding website things to see too. But as always, the most important thing for me is that you have a fun and creative week and I will see you in the next show.